Good evening. I hope everyone will find a comfortable seat, someplace where you can have an unobstructed view of the, uh, the proceedings. Um, I forgot my clicker. Hang on. This wasn't the way we practiced it, but uh, I'm going to introduce now Robin Treen. I have to take the microphone out or I'll walk away from it. I always forget and just sail away. Um, I'm Robin Treen and I work here at the museum and I just want to welcome everybody here tonight for our Pukakacha New Terrains San Jose 2040. Um, so uh, just a couple things real quick, um, a few announcements. There's going to be people coming in and out, so, you know, just ignore them. <laughs> and um, also, for those of you who have cell phones or mobile devices, if you could remember to mute those, that would be great. <laughs> yes, and unmute them as well. So um, tonight we are going to be presenting a Pukakacha, and uh, probably some of you are wondering what the heck is that. And I'm going to let Rick explain what that is, but it is a presentation style that that is fast, fun presentations. You're going to see a number of different um, people up here tonight. We have six presenters from our partner organizations who are all sort of speaking to a very broad theme of new terrains, mobility, and envisioning a shared future for San Jose, kind of tagged to the year 2040, which is the city's current um, master plan. Um, this program is part of New Terrains, which is a large community-wide multidisciplinary initiative that the museum convened with. At this point, I think we have 35 or 36 community partners that we're working with. Everybody's doing all kinds of interesting programs. Um, educational experiences, exhibitions, you name it, it's on the agenda somewhere. So we do have a website under newtrains.org if you want to check out what's happening. Uh, next month for, I'm going to give a shameless plug, next month for Third Thursday, um, we're always late, open late on Third Thursday, we're going to be doing um, an event for New Terrains. It will serve as both the, the opening reception for our contribution to New Terrains which is an exhibition called Other Walks, Other Lines, which is what's being installed here tonight. And then we will also have our partner event. So all of our partners will be invited to come, and they can do something while they're here. So they can perform, they can promote upcoming events or past things that they've done, they can provide activities. So it's, it's a big party, and it's a way to celebrate our community and our partners. So I hope you'll come back for that as well. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is, this is also a program that's part of the Knight Foundation's initiative called Speak Up San Jose. And Knight wanted to create some community conversations to just give every everybody a chance to speak up and to look towards the future of San Jose and to think about how we could create a shared future for that here. So this is also part of that, and it was partially funded by the Knight Foundation, so we do thank them for that. The Knight Foundation has also provided some swag, so if anybody wants it, we have um, buttons and, uh, I don't know, there's some decals and stuff up on the counter here. Please feel free to help yourself before you leave tonight. And let's see, was there anything else I was supposed to cover? Was that it? Anything else? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Suzette. Oh, yeah. So the, the other thing that the um, Knight Foundation wanted is they wanted uh, everybody, they're trying to figure out a way to get people, once they've talked about things, to convert words into action. So they wanted us to make a call to action. So this is our call to action. We're asking everybody here to pledge sometime during New Terrains to take an alternate form of transportation, snap a selfie of yourself doing it, and um, post it with the hashtag New Terrains. All of our partner organizations who are represented here tonight will also be making a call to action at the end of the event. And you can, you can, they may have their own hashtags, but if they don't, you can use our hashtag for those as well. So you're going to hear lots of, um, you're going to be extolled to make some changes. <laughs> okay, is that it? Anything else I need to announce? I think we're good. Okay, so I'm going to give the microphone back to Rick, and he's going to explain to you what a pakakacha is, and we'll get on with the evening. Boom. 
So who here has been to a Pachak Jaw event before? Cool, great. Who's been to one of mine? Even better, cool. I'm Rick Brett Snyder. I'm the founder and host of San Jose Pachaka Jaw. And I want to welcome you to tonight's event where we'll learn strange and terrible PowerPoint secrets. No, we won't. We're not going to learn PowerPoint secrets at all. This is, has nothing to do with PowerPoint. Uh, it's really, well, I'm going to explain to you what Pachakacha is first. And you may be wondering, those of you who haven't seen me before, why I'm doing this for you. This is essentially the team that created PowerPoint. And that's me. I do regularly manifest that halo, so if it happens, don't freak out. It goes away after a while. But this team, those smiles, are because this is an incredibly proud team of what we were doing at that time. And what we were doing at that time was creating a new way to communicate. When we were on that team, this is like back, uh, this team was around 1990 to 93 when I joined. And a, a heavy user of PowerPoint would use it once a month. That was our target audience. So we felt we were knocking it out of the park. But we didn't really hear from much of anybody outside of our own team. It was like our own echo chamber until this guy showed up. Everybody recognizes this guy, right? Do you recognize this cartoon? Because when this cartoon showed up in the paper, we probably didn't have the reaction. We were running up and down the halls showing everyone the cartoon. We're in the, we're in the paper. We're in cartoons. They're making fun of PowerPoint. We've made it. It was funny. But there was this phrase, death by PowerPoint. And that's not necessarily very funny. And, and it's, it's something that I personally took a lot of umbrage to. Because really, PowerPoint's just a tool, like a hammer. And if you look at that chair, do you blame the hammer for that chair? Maybe if the hammer knocked the extra leg off, but not in building the chair. Because that chair was built by somebody who didn't know how to build a chair. The hammer is just a tool. PowerPoint is just a tool. Any presenting tool you use is just a tool. You really have to be a good presenter to not destroy your audience with whatever kind of poisoning you might have at hand. So it was my, I took it upon myself on the team to look for ways that we could make people better presenters within the, within the product, which was not an easy thing. But in 2007, I went with a bunch of designer friends up to San Francisco where I'd heard about this new format called Pachaka Cha. And so we all got in the car, we had a great dinner, we went to, we went to this bar and if you look at that group of people, they're all laughing and smiling and having a great time. Yeah, part of it's because they're drunk. But they're watching a guy do his whole spiel in six minutes and 40 seconds. He's up there and being exciting and delivering a message that they're responsive to. And the vibe in one of these, one of these shows when it's going on is really great. And if it's not, you just have to wait a couple minutes and somebody else will be up there. So, uh, Pachakacha was started in 2003 by two architects of all kinds. All, all, they're, they're both in Tokyo. One's a Brit, one's a German. And they were going to have a conference and they didn't want to have a lot of boring presentations. So, they came up with this format. And it was so successful that it went viral. It went beyond their little convention and it started showing up in Japan in different bars and stuff and people started going to it. And so they founded Pachakacha Night. Well, driving back from San Francisco, we're all in the car and we're all still excited and we're, we should do that because San Francisco is way too far to go. San Jose is way better than San Francisco. We can really put on these shows. We became me. And in 2007, I founded the San Jose Pachacacha branch. Now, Pachacacha is all over the world. 
That number was updated this morning. It was up five cities since the last time I gave this presentation. And San Jose is just one of them. They're all over. You, you can go to pachacha.org and you can find the closest one to you in your city. We're really the only ones in the Bay Area. So I keep on saying the format. And I hinted at six minutes and 40 seconds. But really, there are two simple rules for Pachacacha. The presenters have 20 slides. No more, no less. And each slide automatically advances after 20 seconds. 20 slides, 20 seconds each. You do the math. It's a little difficult because it's 60 seconds. To, but it's 6 minutes and 40 seconds. Now, Robin said Pachacacha one way. If you pay attention to me, I may slip and say it a couple of different ways. It's an automatopoeia, which is a word that means what it sounds like. And the rough translation is chatter. So, Pachacacha, my wife calls it uh, Pikachu. I've heard it called Machu Picchu. Pechacucha, Pachacacha, and some other variations. It doesn't matter how you say it, because it's really just the noise of people talking. So don't be, sh don't be shy. I've had so many people saying, how do you say it? No, say it whatever you want. Why does it work? This paragraph, it's all one paragraph. This is the paragraph that got approved by legal, HR, the health people. Everything's in it that you absolutely need to know for this situation. However, if I'm presenting this to you as an audience, by the time I've read through this far, you've read the whole thing. So I've lost you at that point. It just doesn't work. And really, the only thing you need to know is this. <laughs> and that's what you need to distill your message down to. My friend Gar Reynolds is a, is actually a very famous presenter. He's out of Tokyo as well. He believes that the constraints that we face when we're being creative bring out more innovation, more interesting things out of our creations. David Gerald, people know who David Gerald is? Anybody? No? One, yeah. Uh, Trouble with Tribbles, Star Trek? Anyway. Um, he said this recently, that when he removes words from his story, it gets better. But Mark Twain probably knew the most that it's really hard to do that. It takes work to get your message smaller. And all the presenters here will acknowledge that, I'm sure, that it was harder to come up with these 20 slides than it might have been able to come up with 40. But they're doing 20. So today, we've got six presenters. They're going to finish in about 40 minutes. That's actually a lie, because we're going to have Q&A between each one. And we won't be holding questions for the end. That's also a lie. We're going to have Q&A between each presenter. And then we'll have a big one at the end as well. So you all ready? OK. Chris, are you ready? Great. <clears throat> are we ready? Oh, I'm good. I think I'll just do this. My organization, California Walks, is a nonprofit dedicated to promoting safer, healthier communities. And that work requires that we think critically about the past, present, and future of California cities. San Jose is an exciting place to consider the past, present, and future because of the deep and complex roots and its role as a global center for technology and progress. On one hand, we're proud of our history as the Valley of the Heart's Delight. Many San Joseans have a nostalgic view of the, the agricultural past of the valley before industry brought pollution and congestion. The story is older than that, of course, but more on that in a minute. We're also proud that the region is synonymous with innovation and technology. Our Silicon Valley is the cradle of tomorrow. The brightest minds in the world converge here to solve our looming threats and make our lives safer, healthier, more convenient, and more entertaining.
course, it's more complicated than that, right? Everybody loves to laugh at the story of how the first movie theater patrons ducked as the train barreled towards this camera. That story, as best we know, is not true, but it's satisfying anyway to think about how far we have come. Our futurism is full of cities offering accessible and efficient transportation systems, jetpacks, teleportation systems, clean fuel, autonomous vehicles, distance rendered meaningless, and the byproducts and consequences of transportation systems are nowhere to be seen. When the Tamian people of the Ohlone tribe first settled here thousands of years ago, they soon brought agriculture, domestication of animals, and permanent settlements. While we often don't think of them as such, these settlements were a kind of technological innovation. They changed the shape of the land and our patterns of mobility. And then in ships came the Spanish with another wave of technology, colonization. Colonization, like many subsequent innovations, promised progress. 500 years later, we're beginning to reckon with the question, for whom and at what cost? The pattern repeats for centuries. The toll of westward expansion on native people, the ravaging of resources to sustain cities, the devastation of poor neighborhoods to build highways from cities to suburbs, all in the name of mobility and progress. For whom and at what cost? We come to the present, where we are a century into the public health catastrophe that we barely acknowledge. 40,000 Americans die every year in traffic violence. It is the leading cause of preventable death of American children. It is the equivalent of a fully loaded 747 crashing every three and a half days. Low income neighborhoods experience twice as many pedestrian fatalities in neighborhoods as wealthy areas. In San Jose, maps of our high injury corridors overlap significantly with our immigrant and low income neighborhoods. Seniors are also significantly overrepresented in our injury and fatality rates. There are eight parking spaces for every car in the United States. And in many cities, parking spaces rival housing or commercial space for total land use. In this photo of an average strip mall, red is parking and blue is retail space. Today, we're in a housing crisis in part because highways don't scale. Our current deferred maintenance load, the amount of needed road work we're not doing every year on existing roads is staggering. And each expansion brings more debt and maintenance, and that squeezes cities long after temporary relief fades. But what about the future? In Silicon Valley, we talk about disruption a lot, but history shows who usually gets disrupted by progress. Ask the colonizer, the railroad baron, the highway builder, they will tell you that they were on the side of progress of innovation, of a better future, but for whom and at what cost? Now we're at the epicenter of technology that promises increased convenience in transportation from autonomous vehicles to ride hailing services to electric scooters. The pace of change makes it hard to define new modes of mobility, much less sensibly regulate them. But what's more dangerous? The status quo or the traffic fatality rate is 50% higher than the murder rate or a future where our streets are sold to venture capitalists for beta testing. These companies talk eloquently about corporate responsibility, but when times get tough, where will accountability come from? Will autonomous vehicles save lives by thinking and reacting more quickly than human drivers? Or will they usher in higher speeds and shift blame to pedestrians when crashes do happen? Will they curb human-powered mobility and reduce our already minimal tolerance for human error? Will electric scooter companies reduce car trips and create first and last mile connections to transit? Or will they clutter already inadequate sidewalk space and cannibalize transit systems that are already struggling with declining ridership and revenue? California Walks asks these questions every day because history shows from the Ohlone to urban renewal, technology is always packaged as progress. But at every step, 
from agriculture to industrialization to suburbanization, that progress comes at a cost, and that cost is rarely borne equally by all people. It has taken us centuries to start to reconsider the casualties of progress in colonialism, in Western expansion, and now in suburbanization. Increasingly, it is clear that the exploitation and inequality baked into our cities and mobility has not been a bug. It's been a key feature. Technology can't solve problems until we decide that they're, for, they're worth solving and we invest accordingly. And the solutions to many of our mobility problems are simple and efficient and cheap. What we lack is will. Our first step has to be demanding accountability for those who profit here and forging spaces where the needs and voices of communities are put first. Thank you. So do we have any questions for Chris? California Walks is an advocacy group. We're a nonprofit. We work statewide on policy that advances the rights of uh, pedestrians and vulnerable road users. At the local level, we work with distressed and marginalized communities to advance mobility plans, uh, pedestrian plans. So we're really trying to get more people to walk and make it safer for those who are walking and, and, and make sure that the benefits uh, of, of policy that promotes active transportation, active mobility accrue in an equitable way. Uh, as we said in there, that you know, we that that your 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 zip code is actually a really good predictor of right. Your zip code is a really good predictor of your access to safe sidewalks and and bike lanes and 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 places to go with those sidewalks and bike lanes. So we're interested really strongly in how do we uh, put the resources and the expertise into the hands of neighborhoods that uh, that need them the most. Any questions? Nope. Oh. Go ahead, Roman. What do you think about Repeat your question. I'm sorry? What do you think about driverless cars? What do I think about driverless cars? Oh, we don't have that kind of time, do we? <laughs> <laughs> I think what I said there, I think there's, you know, I think there's arguments that they could, in fact, uh, make, make driving safer. I think one of the biggest contributors to, uh, in, in kind of a forensic sense, one of the biggest contributors to, to our, our casualty rate is inattention. You know, people aren't very well suited to the task of driving. Um, so the idea of a thing that can watch in every direction and look in every direction, um, it seems really appealing in some ways. I, I think that there are probably an unintended consequences of that, and I, I alluded to some of those earlier, which, you know, the idea that uh, we used to have this idea, that I think for a while we were talking about driverless vehicles as, 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 as the solution to distracted driving and solution to crashes, but there's also a way of looking at it that I think we're starting to be concerned about who, who's accountable when, when things do go wrong and who do we blame when things do go wrong? You know, is, is it actually going to make it safer? You know, our goal, our goal, our ideal street isn't a street where pedestrians, you know, march lockstep and everyone behaves perfectly. People are imperfect. Children are imperfect in particular, and they're particularly vulnerable already. Uh, seniors are particularly imperfect. They're overrepresented in our traffic fatalities really significantly as well. So uh, if you have a situation where mistakes are, are killing people, then I don't know that we want to have a situation that has less tolerance for mistakes. And that's, I think, one of the concerns that we have. The other thing is it doesn't solve a lot of the problems. It doesn't solve our land use problems. It doesn't solve uh, the fact that we do dedicate so much of our space to roads. So I'd, l I'd rather see, you know, uh, buses and, and active transit and other options. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, we can help. <laughs> we do workshops. We work in the neighborhood level. Uh, I think that um, the, their, your, your council member is actually going to be a really good resource with that and, and, and seeing what they have planned. Um, each council district gets a set amount of resources for uh, pedestrian improvements. Um, if you work with them and find out where those are, um, the, the, um, there is a bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee at the city level. They take feedback. You can go in and talk to them. Um, I think making sure that people know that there's a problem is, is, the, is the main thing. And voting, you know, vote for candidates, hold your candidates accountable for, uh, for putting people first before cars and before companies, corporate profits. Anybody else? Well, I guess that's it then. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. 
And next up is Usha. America is a melting pot. Yes. <laughs> you know, we've all heard this phrase. It's a term that's been in use since 1700s to describe the social and cultural integration of newcomers to this land of immigrants. This notion that people can come here from different countries and in this crucible of democracy and freedom are able to forge this new identity, this new homogenous identity as yes, Americans. To understand why and how this model of social integration, the melting pot, worked, we need to look at the history of immigration to America. Immigration to the United States has happened in waves. We are right now in what is considered the fifth wave of immigration. And each wave is characterized by a set of countries that have contributed the most in terms of immigrants, and a set of factors, both push and pull factors, that have forced these immigrants to feel like they need to leave their homelands in search of a better life. The very first country, first wave of immigration happened in the colonial era in the early 1600s when people from Western Europe came here fleeing religious persecution. These were the pilgrims and the Puritans. And then they came in larger numbers again from Western and Northern Europe in search of more liberties and also in search of better opportunities. The second wave of immigration happened largely from Ireland and Germany. We all heard about the potato famine, which drove large numbers of Irish people to come here. Also, in, um, in the first wave, at the end of the first wave, we had seen large numbers of slaves that were brought here. So in the third wave of immigration, we had people now coming from southern Europe um, also Eastern Europe. We had the Jews that were being persecuted and they fled. Um, we had Italians coming as a result of an explosion in population that meant um, smaller opportunities, fewer opportunities. So as you can tell, these immigrants that came in the first three waves, they all shared a few things in common. With the exception of those who came from Africa as slaves, these were people that came voluntarily and came with one-way tickets to, the, to America. They had no intention to go back. They were also largely white. They came from Judeo-Christian faith backgrounds. And despite the, change, the differences in their uh, nationalities and linguistics, they shared Anglo-Saxon cultural norms, all of which made it easier and even reasonable and viable to expect that here in America, they would shed those unique cultural traits and within one or two generations, maybe even sooner through intermarriage and so on, would actually take on this uniform American identity. Now that worked pretty well until 1965 when we saw the beginning of the fourth wave of immigration. Thanks to the passing of the Immigration and Naturalization Act, we suddenly had all those restrictions that kept out non-whites from immigrating here lifted and we saw a large influx of immigrants from Asia and Latin America. Now the thing about these immigrants, as you can imagine, they were quite different from their predecessors. They came from very different faiths, different cultural backgrounds, different social racial backgrounds. And so the notion of assimilating was a harder one for them. And around the same time, we also had developments in travel as well as communications that pretty much shrunk the globe, which meant that people are able to travel back to their lands of origin and communicate and keep those cultural ties fresh and renewed. And then there is that big factor, the fact that if some, let's say tomorrow my kids decided they were done with being Indian American, they wanted to take on new names that were more pronounceable, they no longer wanted to eat curry because they're gonna be American, they're still gonna be asked, but where are you really from? And that's why this model of the melting pot no longer works. What we see now is these waves of immigrants that have come in the fourth and fifth wave, when they come here in large enough numbers and in places where you no longer have a single majority or you have a shrinking majority, we see these immigrants kind of 
getting into cultural silos, getting into um, to work, eat, pray, play, celebrate with others who look like them because that's what makes them comfortable. And because even if they gave up all their cultural identity, they still would not be American. They would be hyphenated Americans. And within these silos, and we see this right here in San Jose, you see people really holding on to these wonderful cultural practices. There are music and dance and other forms of cultural expression, cuisine, that is thriving in these silos. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that this represents kind of a breaking down of the social fabric because we need an American identity that transcends any one race or ethnic group. And right now, we find that that is not happening. We find people living in these silos. That's because the model doesn't work. So what do we do? How can we fix this problem? What is a good alternative to this melting pot that has been part of our a vernacular for so long and it has been a successful model. Well, we think the alternative is a mosaic. When you think about a mosaic, the individual tessera, each are beautiful and brilliant and vibrant, but it is what they create together that makes it truly brilliant, a harmonious, vibrant whole. It's the same thing with our cultures. What if we all came together as we are and regardless of what we look like, eat, or who we play to, as long as we subscribe to American values of equality and freedom and liberty, that we came together in a way that allowed us to celebrate our common humanity while also relishing our differences. And at Sangam Arts, we believe that this can be done through the arts because the arts offers an excellent platform for bringing together, for strengthening community by using artists to bring together audiences. So. That is my introduction to Mosaic America, which is a program of Sangam Arts. Well, uh, insight into, uh, I get to see all these slides for a couple of weeks before the event. I never hear the dialogue. So it's like, I, I'm familiar with every image there, and it's really special for me when I actually see a really interesting story that comes about. So that was really terrific. Uh, questions? Yeah, so um, the question is, how do we bring this notion of kind of integrating despite our differences to other places in the United States? And that's, you know, I can tell you what our idea is and our thoughts. We need to kind of help redefine what it means to be American. You know, um, right now that's very narrowly defined, not because of what the white people are telling us, it's what we, how we define ourselves. I'll tell you an interesting anecdote. My daughter came home one day in seventh grade and she was so excited about something and she said, Amma, there's this Asian kid in my class and you know, I didn't grow up here. So I was like, wait a minute, you do know India is in Asia, right? What, what the heck? And then she started telling me about, no, 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 this is the Asians, like Chinese, and then we have South Asian, and then we have uh, other kinds of Americans. So I asked her, and so then we talked about the different types of Americans. She said, we have one Mexican-American, we have no African-Americans, and, you know. And then I said, so who's American here? And she said, well, that would be Isabel. And it turns out that Isabel is actually not American. Her parents are expats from Ireland. So, you know, this is a child that is willing to confer the American identity on somebody who's not even American. So I think it, it's because in, her, in this child's mind, you know, American is a certain way. Maybe it's white, maybe it's Anglo-Saxon, I don't know. And I think what, what is happening is we need to break down these silos. We need to all come together and say, it's perfectly fine if you're wearing a hijab, it doesn't matter. 
we are all Americans, we just need to abide by the American values. And the best way to do that is to understand each other, and what better way to understand each other than getting together in a non-agenda-driven social setting. And the reason I say that the arts is great for this is especially when you look at music. You know, there's some things that are universal. Rhythm is universal. You bring together people who are doing percussions of different kinds, and you'll see they'll start jamming in no time at all because music is a universal language. And then if you use that, you, you, you create an environment where you can bring in people who have something to offer, and they bring in their followers. You know, when you create a, a mosaic of dance like we do normally, the artists bring their own followers, but for the first time, these followers see something new. You know, we did a show called Strings and Bow that had the sitar, which is an Indian instrument. We had the cello, and we had a pipa, which is a Chinese string instrument. Each of the artists brought their own followers, but guess what? Those followers, for the first time, experienced, in some cases, the cello and the pipa. And when the artists played in concert, they were like, oh my god, you know, there is so much in common. And that kind of is the beginning of a dialogue. It's kind of like, yeah, the differences don't matter. This is something we need to develop. We need to develop a cultural competency, to, a, a competency towards multiculturalism. You know, and that is something, because the diversity has come so fast and furious, we have not developed that over time. Versus a place like India, for example, where we have dealt with this kind of cultural flux that has happened over centuries and done it successfully. So. In India, diversity is everywhere, and we have a way of dealing with it. But because this has happened in like less than 50 years, and the pace is increasing, we just don't know how to go about kind of uh, creating this. I know that's a long answer, but <laughs> I should probably let. Anyone else? So the, the question is, is it polite to ask where are you from? I think absolutely. Because, uh, and this is a great point, because you know, you'll see people kind of tiptoeing and walking on eggshells around this notion of identity. Because when I say the word multiculturalism, a lot of times it, it conjures up this kind of all this politics around ethnic you know, minorities versus the majorities versus the whites. So I think that the topic has become fraught. Um, but I think it doesn't have to be. And once we all kind of say, you can be American if you speak with an accent like I do, it doesn't matter where you come from, you know, we're all American. I think the, that stigma of kind of asking where are you from will go away. Because we can all bring where we are from with great pride and offer it up in this mosaic. So um, there is a little bit of sensitivity around like asking people, where are you from? What's your culture? You know? And I think that goes back to that lack of confidence and competency around culture that we need to develop in our kids. Oh, yeah. So she has, brings up a good point, Nicole. Um, she said, what's really not polite is to ask, what are you? <laughs> Where are you from is okay. It's perfectly legit. Good point. Yeah, and, and that is um, actually when people ask you where are you really from, that's their way of asking what is your heritage, right? And it doesn't necessarily come from a bad place where they're saying you're not American, you alien, where are you from? N not necessarily, right? Um, and I think for, to some extent, people need to feel like you can be from anywhere and still be American. And that is something that hasn't pervaded, that's a notion that has not been accepted in, gen in general. And um, I don't take offense when somebody asks me where I'm from. 
you know, I would take offense if they feel that because of where I'm from, I am less American, because that's not true. <laughs> I am American and proud of it. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Next up is Heidi. This is Michael here. Hello, everybody. Thank you for that great background. It actually is perfectly connected to what, yeah. Common Ground is seated at the table as a traveling creative space that invites children and families to explore and create connections between food, cultural identity, and our Silicon Valley communities. We are funded in part by IMLS. We thank our partner Citizens for Better Community, Filipino American City Employees of San Jose, India Community Center, International Children Assistance Network, and Somos Mayfair. A seat at the table has become a meaning-making space and an active metaphor. It has traveled and adapted to new terrains. It has invited and welcomed people to create and share. It has become an archive building with every iteration and reflective of our San Jose communities. We launched Breaking Ground in 2012. It was a multi-year project, bringing together families from Mexico, Vietnam, India, the Philippines, and China. Over dinner and through prompts, participants shared about their experiences as immigrants in the United States. Most recently, Common Ground expanded our efforts to promote cross-cultural exchange through community dinners, a workshopping process to develop and travel a seat at the table locally. Through the dinners leading up to a seat at the table, the sharing of a meal, conversations about their own childhoods, and facilitated dinner discussions, adults found commonality in the things that surprised, concerned, and gave them hope when they came to the US. Some example dinner prompts were, choose an object that reminds you of your home country. Share a story of your home country with someone else. Building from the successful dinner conversations where objects used in med and, and meal making and eating sparked meaningful conversations, our development team prioritized how best to engage both children and adults in culture talk, ways of finding similarities and noting differences in their experiences. What can we build that would be flexible, inviting, and honor the years of work with our community members? Our priority was to draw and welcome people into the space on a multi-sensory level. And from that, we hope that we can engage them in meaningful conversation about their lived experiences. We came up with a hybrid space that felt like a kitchen table, a market, and a home. At the very back of the space is our composite poem. What is our common ground? It includes lines from our community workshop where everyone created a poem prompting them about cultural identity, childhood memories, and hopes for future generations. This has become the starting point for engaging our visitors to contribute their own piece to the poem. The first visible prompt hangs over the entrance. Find your seat at the table. On the right before entering, a dispensary of six different types of Play-Doh for sculpture making. The entrance is framed by cooking objects from the community dinners. There are 16 seats, two U-shaped tables, four facilitators. The community poem is at the back with um, a poem prompt cards with poem prompt cards surrounding it. After selecting their top choices for Play-Doh, people are invited into the space. Facilitators welcome visitors to the table using often similar prompts used at our community dinners and introducing them to the tools available. Children are of the majority of participants at the tables. While caregivers are standing around, we invite them to contribute to the community poem. Our Play-Doh offerings, pandan, ube, curry, paprika, cocoa, cinnamon. There is instant curiosity. What are those? Can I eat it? Is it food? We invite people to smell the Play-Doh, ask them if it reminds them of anything or anyone that they know. One child shared that the curry dough reminded him of his grandma in Hawaii. Tools and objects on the table invite one to mold, press, build, pound, flatten, and shape their Play-Doh into food sculptures. Among the many objects are mooncake molds, an idli tray, mashers, roti rollers, tortilla presses, mocajetes, banana leaves. We ask, have you used this before? Do you know of someone who does? Would you like to know more about this? Facilitators support children and their caregivers and the visiting group as a whole to engage in conversation. They have been trained on different objects, their uses, and names. They've been trained on how to ask open-ended questions that prompt visitors to share about favorite food and cultural traditions. Often at the table, collaboration, demonstrating and experimenting between adult and child takes place. For example, this one father is demonstrating how to use a mooncake mold to his daughter. We ask, have you seen this, this before? When? Do you help your family member cook with this object? What types of food do you love? What kind of foods do you make at home? Who makes it? 
Often in the space, visitors will work together, share objects, and talk about what they are making. My grandma has one of these. She makes tortillas with it. We have one at home. One girl told us how she used the mocajete with her grandma to make chile, and other, another girl told us about baking bread and using a rolling pin. In addition to conversation, sculpture making, and writing activities, we have invited artists into the space to share their responses to the project. Visual artist Tiffany Lin creates a drawing of a visual recipe for each installation. At our debu debut at Chile Mole Pozole at the Mexican Heritage Plaza, she made a pozole recipe and learned herself that there are many variations of pozole and mole. We have had formal presentations. Mrs. Vo presented on traditional dresses from North, Central, and South Vietnam. We've invited poets to read in the space. Vong Vu shared his poetry about fried chicken, one of his first memorable meals after immigrating to San Jose from Vietnam. Pushpa McFarland shared her poetry about her family's kitchen table. She sang in Hindi and Urdu. A seat at the table has reached about 3,000 people through its journey so far. Our aim is to reach 12,000. Our work has fe was featured in the SGA Mercury News. In it, a father was quoted, I think growing up these kids will appreciate seeing different people from different backgrounds and be able to work and live with them. We have had repeat visitors on one day and some followers who have traveled along with us. Some visitors spend up to an hour making endless creations and experimenting, while others walk away with our recipe card and Play-Doh samples. Here, appetizers are displayed by a visitor on the Idli Maker. Upper right corner are examples of mooncakes made with the molds on our tables. Visitors activate the space, create the archive of experience, and leave their thoughts on our cards that create the installation framing the community poem. From the abstract to the concrete, most people are open to share after spending time in the space. They share their hopes and who they are through writings and drawings. At its core, a seat at the table is a pluralistic space where people come together to share their cultural experiences and traditions, create meaning through creative engagement and expression, with children leading the way. Here at its most recent debut, a seat at the table sits at Marshall Cottle, Cottle Park as part of Viva Calle SJ. This installation was accessed by people through a variety of transportation means, featuring a large cross-section of San Jose's communities. Thank you for your time. Okay. Does someone sit down? Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was, how did we choose the, uh, the, uh, the groups, um, the immigrant groups? Um, so those are the top groups in San Jose. It was identified by the, our uh, museum developers. I actually wasn't involved with that part of the project. Most of my involvement has been in the development of the activity space, you know, and the, and the um, activities there. But, so yeah, it's reflective of the San Jose's top immigrant populations. And adapt it, definitely. And actually a seat at the table is really of bringing together by traveling, we're opening up the dialogue and the conversations using those dinners as kind of a model to engage people in conversation. Well, okay, so uh, for example, we've had long-term partnerships with um, these communities, and so we've developed, you know, we've developed ongoing relationships with those community partners, um, and so easily accessible were, you know, those community partners and, and the groups, but definitely, this is just kind of a, kind of like the beginning of our work, so. Anyone else? Yeah, so at the tables, I have examples of the Play-Doh. And then also at the other um, tables, there are cards and poem prompts. Um, feel free to fill them out, explore, experiment. And we have our recipe cards and a little bit more about our project on, on the recipe cards. Thank you. Next up is JT.
Man, everyone's been amazing. You guys, are, you guys are incredible. Hit it, Rick. My name is JT Service. I am uh, the CEO of Soul Focus Sports. I'm talking to you tonight about the Run Local movement, or something that we call the Run Local movement. This is, um, this is the work we do here in San Jose in the Bay Area, but also the philosophy in that we do it with. Bye. This is also my worst nightmare because I don't do scripts very well. So here we go. Uh, Run Local is very much about place. Uh, for us, it's very much about social progress. And it's also about donuts. And they, that obviously all goes together. You guys see where I'm going with this. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about myself and where I came from and, and how we got here. This is me at kind of the pinnacle of my athletic achievement. This is the US Marathon Olympic trials. Um, I'm running twice a day. I'm going to law school at Santa Clara. I'm super busy and kind of just selfish and just taking care of myself and, and trying to take, make myself happy. I graduate law school and I immediately leave the profession. And I become an event producer, a race producer, do work for the San Francisco Giants, Stanford University, some small group, group called the Facebook might recognize Mr. Zuckerberg there. Uh, now this is not misleading at all. Uh, I obviously didn't leave the profession for the money. Um, he made a little bit, there's an Uber guy in there, all of Mark's friends. But the truth is I did it because I loved it. I got really into what I do, which is produce events for other people. Uh, we started something called Represent Running. You may have heard of a race, it's called the San Jose 408K. It's an 8K from one side of San Jose to the other. Um, the final mile is the Mariachi Mile. And it's, uh, it's very much San Jose. It's like, we just tried to make it about the culture here. It's just a simple run. Uh, most recently, we started a run group called the Run Local 408. And most recently, we partnered with the San Jose Museum of Art. And we just meet up in front of the, the museum. We ran to 12 different murals around San Jose and uh, just to celebrate local art, but also to take down the boundaries of like registering for an event or to be super fit. It was just to get together and make people smile. And, and that's my biggest goal. Like that's what I wake up to do, is to see how many people I can make smile. From myself, to my immediate family, to people in the community. Thought I'd time that one better. <laughs> there it is. If you've seen a TED Talk, they always have great diagrams. So I wanted one. So I made one. And you can drink it in. You baby, your babies, all the babies. And once we do that, it's smiling on down to magical donut land. But uh, this is why I did that. It's because I, I often feel overwhelmed. I'm a, I am a surfer, but this is what it feels like to me sometimes when it's like I want to make great things happen in the community but I want to take care of myself and I want to take care of my family and sometimes it just feels like too much so I try to simplify and what can I control I think it starts with you if you're ever feeling like there's something you want to do great or you're having a hard time I think it starts with taking care of yourself first you can't take care of other people before taking care of yourself uh, this is from unsplash.com, shout out, Facebook Live. This is one of my favorite people right now. Her name is Desiree Linden, and this woman takes care of herself. She tried to win the Boston Marathon about five times. She lost in a sprint finish, she lost due to injury, she lost due to just amazing talent around her. Last year she won, first American to win in 30 years. She took care of herself, and she inspired women all over the country. This is a picture of a bunch of puppies. It's not just puppies. It's also an example of taking care of your babies. Once you take care of yourself, you open yourself up to take care of others, take care of your babies, take care of your puppies. This is my mom. She's right there in the back. She's one of my favorite people to put on the spot. <laughs> it's because she loves me. And it's, it's a great example of like just taking care of your own babies, taking care of your people. And it allows me to get up here with confidence and talk ridiculous things. Because I know she'll still love me afterwards. So let's go back to ridiculous diagram number one. You baby, check. Taking care of your babies, check. 
I think what's next is once you've done that, you open yourself up to take care of other people, to create events, to go after your passions. Eventually, Magic Donut Land. This is me in like my element. Once I'm like feeling good about myself and taking care of my family and my people, I can get out in the community and I can create free events, training groups, programs, run local 408, meet every Wednesday night at 6 p.m., teach kids about fitness and movement. This is one of my heroes right now. This is Earl Hooks. He lives in the Rose Garden. Uh, Earl took step number one. He beat alcoholism, took care of himself, took care of his families back there. He's a great dad. He started a community thing called Hooked on Fitness. He, he trains his own neighbors, and now he's taking kids out of urban environments and into the woods. He's, he's an amazing man. Now magical donut land, clearly. If we're not taking care of ourselves, taking care of babies, taking care of other people, once we do all those things, we can take people to magical donut land, which I believe is like guys like Carlos, Juan Carlos Arroyo. He owns Empire Seven Studios. He's an artist. He opened a gallery for other people. Now he's curating art all over the city. He's taking care of the entire community because he took care of himself first, then others. And now he, how many people has he made smile? Like, we'll never know. I guess what I'm encouraging you to do is to run local. And that starts with yourself. It starts with your family. It starts with your community. And if we can just change, like, our communities just a little bit, then maybe we can change the world together. That's it. Woo. That goes faster than you think. It, it, it's always, it either goes faster than you think or slower than you think. It's never exactly right. Any questions? Yes. Oh, let's, first of all, I'm going to repeat the statement, and she was thanking me for a wonderful presentation. Um, <laughs> next, I'm going to repeat the question, and is what was my specialty in law? I actually worked at the Catherine and George Alexander Community Law Firm. It's a, right on the Alameda. It's a workers, immigrants rights. Every Tuesday, they have an intake clinic. Um, I did a few cases then, and, and I honestly, I still like have dreams of becoming a lawyer. I, I passed the California bar. I'm still a, a, still a lawyer. I just haven't quite, uh, you know, played with that yet. Cool. Thank you. And now Nicole. Okay. All right. Uh, who here is a parent? Anybody? Any parents in the room? Who here works? Anybody have a job? Okay. Who here is a working parent? Okay. All right, my peoples. My peoples. I am also a working parent. Um, I've been a working parent for almost 30 years. And yes, I had my first child at two, but shh. Uh, these are my children, and they're lovely, and my journey in motherhood has taught me a lot. And uh, JT's uh, presentation has a, a lot of synergy with what I'm going to talk about today, which is how to survive being a working parent. Because he talked a lot about uh, taking care of yourself, and really, if you want to focus on your goals, if you want to attain your goals and take care of other people, it really is about taking care of yourself first. And so I'm going to share my five strategies with you. And uh, the first one is embrace guilt. Guilt is just a part of parenthood, mostly motherhood, really. <laughs> but um, it's going to happen. There's so much to do. There are so many things. And, uh, you know, at some point you're going to have to sacrifice something. It's going to be not going to your kid's event. It's going to be maybe not spending enough time with your spouse, 
or not taking care of you. And that you part is super important because as Chris said earlier, if you don't take care of you, you can't take care of them. And so embrace the guilt. It's okay. Go to the spa. Get your nails done. Focus on your career for a little bit. Not, don't neg neglect the kids, but really do focus on you. Accept that you're going to feel guilty and then move on with it. Um, it's just, it's, it's true, right? Yeah. Uh, the next strategy is to say no. I love saying no to my kids. It's so much fun. It's absolute. There's no question about what I mean. And, um, but I found, I found that I wasn't saying no to other people, and I found that I was overcommitting myself. I, I'm a joiner. I like doing things. I like signing up for stuff all the time. And I mapped out all the different activities and all the different people I had committed things to. And this is a real true story. And I was overwhelmed. I was going crazy. I was super stressed. And I found I needed to simplify and pick my battles. So my daughter had a bake sale at school, and she wanted me to make s cupcakes from scratch. But I was overwhelmed, and so I picked up some pretzels, dipped them in chocolate, put some sprinkles on it, and it was fine. It was, everybody loved them. So pick your battles and say no. The next thing is say yes. Say, because you've simplified your life, you've picked your battles, you can say yes to the things that really count, the things that help move the needle forward to the things that you really want to do. And a huge passion of mine is teaching at the College of Adaptive Arts. And these are two of my students. And I, on every Friday, I teach uh, public speaking. It's called Speak with Confidence. And even though I have a full-time job, when I was looking for work, I made sure everybody knew that Fridays I teach, and that's like, I can't budge on that. And um, so I've prioritized. I prioritize what's important to me what's important for my family, and I, I try to choose wisely and keep in mind the things that I really want to do that takes care of me. Now, the fourth uh, strategy I want to share with you is being uncomfortable. Sometimes we do things where, you know, we may find ourselves standing in front of a room full of strangers talking about things, and it might feel a little uncomfortable. But live in that space. Do it. Because when you feel uncomfortable, it means you're out of your comfort zone. And that's where the magic happens. It's OK to be uncomfortable. It's OK to be scared. Because when you experience fear, it teaches you a lot about yourself. Um, a few years ago, I did a, uh, I, I did, uh, I fly with my son. And for whatever reason, I was super scared. I knew I wasn't going to plummet to my death, but I was scared to do this for some reason. And that experience taught me a lot about how I handle fear, how I process things, and it taught me how to manage in situations where I was scared. And so continue to be uncomfortable and learn from those experiences and help use those experiences to inform what you can do to be better. Now, my fifth strategy, I'm going to tell you about in a second. But first, I'm going to let you know there's nothing, there's no work-life balance. There, there's just, it does not exist. I, in my 28 years of being a mom, I have never experienced a balance between work and my life. What I have experienced every day is a work-life juggle. A work-life juggle. <laughs> so, there are things we're constantly throwing in the air, you know, time with the kids, time for your career, time for yourself, time with your spouse, time with your friends, and then time for you. There's, there's never a time when it's all perfectly in sync. And so, you know, for this uh, presentation tonight, I had to deliver a presentation to Rick two weeks ago, and he's sending me emails, and I just got this new job, and that was a ball I dropped, and I dropped a lot of balls. Like, when one thing is super heavy on your mind, you're going to drop the balls, but it's okay. Just pick it back up, throw it up in the air, 
and keep juggling. And remember, you can do anything you want, but you can't do everything. So remember my five strategies. <laughs> Embrace guilt, say no, say yes, be uncomfortable, and keep juggling. <laughs> Thank you. No. <laughs> Any questions? No questions? All right. Seriously, I don't remember you being late. <laughs> I solved all your problems. Sir. Which, which message? That message? This everything? Uh, so the question is, how do I uh, deliver this message to my kids? And as they witness it in progress, so I live it every day. <laughs> and I nag them, and I figure something is going to get implanted in their brains and st keep and take root, I hope. <laughs> uh, question is, what do I do in my spare time? Uh, in my spare time, I try to go to the bathroom in peace. <laughs> um, there was a question over here, and then I'll go over here. Um, I think the thing that I embraced first was saying no, because that's what my mother taught me. <laughs> and, and also, that helped me simplify. Once I was able to clear a lot of that extra out of my head, I was able to think more about it. And I, you know, a lot of self-realization and self-awareness about what I was doing. I still feel guilty. I had a business trip this week and I felt super guilty about leaving my daughter for two days. But, you know, it's there. <laughs> and... The question is, do, do I think a shorter work week, 32 instead of 40, would help? Um, I, I, actually, I, I do think so. So when I'm at work, I am very focused. I'm very present. Like, even when the kids call me, I'm like, is this important? Um, because I want to give everything to the people where I'm with, which is why I hate texting, because texting takes me out of the moment. But... Um, I do think 32 hours would work for me, only because I'm very efficient in what I do. <laughs> so the question is, a very good question, how do I share the balance with my husband? And my husband is an amazing partner. He really helps a lot. I definitely would not be able to do all the things that I do without his help. Um, he's very present for our daughter. He gets her to and from places. Um, he's very supportive of me and my career aspirations. And, um, you know, at home, we, we definitely have, like, a delineation of jobs. He's outside, I'm inside. <laughs> But then sometimes he cooks dinner for me, and he always makes me a drink on a Thursday and Friday night. That's, that's great. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, she wants to know more about my speaking class. And so College of Adaptive Arts is a school for adults with disabilities. And my oldest son... Uh, Saeed, he has Down syndrome, and that's how I got involved with them. And uh, I was taking Toastmasters. I was board president at the time of CAA, and then I was taking Toastmasters, and I wanted to do a class, and the class just took off. And um, it's amazing. So it's called Speak with Confidence, and the students come, and we learn about verbal storytelling, impromptu speaking. Um, I teach them skills that help improve their confidence in speaking. So um, vocal variety, how to stand up and talk to people without freaking out. Um, 
it's, I love it. It's so much fun and everybody has a great time. And if any of you are interested in um, College of Adaptive Arts, we do tours every Friday and you can go on our website, collegeofadaptivearts.org and sign up and you will not regret it. Everybody who comes through falls in love with our students and our staff. Oh, great, great mom question. So the question is, um, what are my thoughts on perfectionism and, and how it applies to my whole philosophy? Um, I have one of those little wooden signs in my house that says, um, what does it say? It says, uh, happy kids, dirty oven, sticky floors. You know, like, I've given up on a clean house. If my house is clean, and you come over, it's because I knew you were coming over and I just finished cleaning it. <laughs> um, you, you can't, you can't do it. You, you really, it goes back to, um, you know, picking your battles. Like the dishes are gonna be there, but if my daughter wants to play Scrabble or some other game, you know, she's gotta go to bed in an hour so I could do the dishes later. Um, so it depends on what, what's important to you. And um, never shoot for perfection because you'll always disappoint yourself. You'll always frustrate yourself. And nobody else is looking for perfection. They just want what you got. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. I think we have one more speaker. Back to you. Thank you. I'm going to do a little, a little introduction here because... Uh, you, if you've been paying attention, most of the slides that you've seen people use today have been single images, maybe a couple images, usually striking, clean, clear, uh, short messages, and things you aren't seeing are a lot of crazy transitions and animation, which is ironic because I spent a large portion of my life building those into the application. <laughs> but on a couple of occasions in, in the 11 years I've been doing this, I've had people say, I'd like to use a video. Um, and I always say, okay, do you know how to use video? Because if there's one thing that could go wrong in a presentation, it's going to be the video. Now, I do a lot of stuff to prepare the deck so nothing's going to go wrong. I've run this multiple times so we won't see any problems. But if we have any, it'll be right now because, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Carolyn asked me if she could do her whole presentation as one long video. And I said, okay, as long as it's 20 images and is done in 6 minutes and 40 seconds and 20 second transitions between the images. She stepped up. So there are two reasons why Carolyn is finishing off today. One if things explode right now, at least we got through the first five. <laughs> but truly, I think this is perhaps one of the more beautiful presentations I've seen in this format, and I just wanted to acknowledge that before she comes up here and let you know how lucky you are to see her. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rick, for uh, that lovely introduction. And um, can we get a round of applause for all of the presenters tonight? I think they were so, so amazing. Um, and thank you all for having me here and inviting me to Pachacucha. Sounds like abracadabra. <laughs> um, OK. Um, my name is Carolyn Lay. And uh, I'm ready to start. Chopsticks Alley Art is a nonprofit art organization, and our mission is to promote Southeast Asian cultural heritage through the shared expression of art. And we strive to make art more accessible for our community and provide a space for community building. And I want to ask how do we learn about a culture? 
History is one way, but history is not always written by us. Art, however, is something that a culture constantly produces um, as an effort to remind people that we are here and we are thriving. I identify as a second generation Southeast Asian American, and all my life I've been searching for my origin story. And it can't be that hard because it only happened a generation ago, but it is because immigrant origin stories are often very painful to verbalize. So Chopsticks Alley Art came up with one way to navigate this intergenerational gap, and it's called the Salt Stained Exhibit. In Vietnamese, the word nook translates to both water and country. And so when you remove the nook from the Southeast, Asia, Southeast Asian body, what's left is our salt stained skin, a bitter reminder that we have crossed oceans to leave the nook that nourished us, the nook that was our livelihood, and the nook that we once crawled home. Salt Stain showcases communal storytelling through works of art by Southeast Asians whose stories challenge dominant narratives. In one of our Salt Stained artists, Bin Don, uh, forms connections to his history through transferring or imprinting images, historical documents from refugee camps onto leaves. And in 2002, Bin Don uh, visited a refugee camp in Malaysia where he and his family once lived. And in this piece, and you'll see in the next, you can see the evidence of the people who had lived there and found ways to build community. And eventually, these historical documents will decay and seep into the soil, and it, be it becomes imprinted into the landscape. And soon, plants will grow, and their DNA will contain the very essence of these uh, people's histories. This is Kenneth Ronquillo and his Lola, and they found a really cool way to bridge this intergenerational gap. Their journey began when Kenneth said uh, he moved home to, to take care of Lola, and Kenneth noticed that usually she just watches Netflix all day, and so Lola, uh, he asked Lola, what would you like to do today other than Netflix on repeat? She says, something that is for a purpose, and so they began making art together. As Lola paints, she tells him a story or stories about her childhood living in the Philippines. And Kenneth would go in with pen and marker and bring those stories to life. This one here is Jin Mai's interpretation of a family tree, discovering her own origin story. And if you look closely, you can see some of the pieces have an empty uh, or just a silhouette of a profile. A void, but not really empty a reminder that loss doesn't mean gone. And this one is a photograph of Jin Mai's father-in-law. Uh, the tears you see symbolize the amount of bullets that entered his body, 17 gunshot wounds. And while these wounds may never really heal, they are proof that he's not just a victim to be pitied, rather someone who has survived despite the odds and has the scars to prove it. This one here is a film by Chopsticks Alley Arts titled Food Memories which is an attempt to bridge the intergenerational gap. I learned that you can't just ask someone, how did you come to America? What was it like as a refugee immigrant? Because I've been asking my mom that all my life. And she's always said, you're so nosy. And that was the end of it. But not too long ago, we were having dinner. Um, and we're on our dinner table. And I asked her, hey, Ma, what was the first thing you ate when you came to America? cup noodles, she said. <laughs> Why? Um, and then the floodgates opened. She started being more uh, open with me and telling me her stories. And so, pro tip, when you ask an immigrant for their origin story, ask what they ate. At the Salt Saint exhibit, I've seen people cry and laugh and tell me they couldn't wait to ask their moms or that they look forward to coming back with their families to see the video. The point of this project is to start a conversation. And guess what? That's my mom. I'm pretty excited to have actually gotten her on this video to share her story. It took a whole lifetime to do that. My whole lifetime. Chopsticks Alley believes that Southeast Asian art is paramount to our identities as individuals and as a community. And the origin stories, they're not over. Today, you only got a taste of it, and to get the fuller story, check out our exhibit, 
because this weekend from 4 to 6 p.m., we have an event titled Our Immigration Stories. Attendees will have the opportunity to contribute to a communal art piece, which will be exhibited at City Hall. Um, and so, yeah, that's right. Salt Stain Part 2 is coming to City Hall. SGMA, let us know if you're interested in a Part 3. <laughs> And so um, a fi some final remarks about Chopsticks Alley as an organization. Since January, we've had over 10,000 uh, attendees, served 89 students with our art workshops, um, and 37% of our budget went to artists themselves. I skipped, I skipped a slide, oops. There it is. <laughs> And so every piece of art tells a story, and people draw their own meaning from it. In my giving you a virtual tour of Salt Stain today, we're preserving these artist stories, but we're also creating new ones at this very moment as we share this experience together. Skip that one. And so uh, stay tuned, because our story is not over. Uh, check out Salt Stained at Art Object Gallery in Japantown. See how art can help an entire community heal and be sure to check out part two at City Hall. Together, let's build an art community. Thank you. Pro tip, if you make a mistake in a presentation, never admit it. <laughs> People will not know. I have been doing this for decades. They won't know, never admit a mistake. No one would have caught on originally. <laughs> Any questions? Um, and if anyone is interested in the exhibit, it's free. I do have brochures here, so I can pass them out. Or you can come and talk to me at the end. And I am, I guess I am the end. So, so after I leave, you can come. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, so the question was, how did I get involved with Salt Stained? Um, I wanted to find a community to belong to, and I found Chopsticks Alley. Started off as a food foodie group, and really, um, I remember you know earlier we were talking about how music you know kind of is encompasses, it, there's no language to music, but I feel the same way with food. Um, when immigrants come over here to America, a lot of times it's very difficult for them to share their stories even if they wanted to, because sometimes the, the community doesn't understand them. And so the first thing you see is the, the food, the restaurants that they have. And you go in there and you, and you taste the food and you, and you get the stories out of that. Um, and eventually, you know, with Chopsticks Alley, we, we saw a need in, in our community for, for a platform for, to, to tell stories other than through food. We wanted to do it through art. And through the Chopsticks Alley Food Memories Project, we bridged that together. Um, and so that people can have conversations with their families or just people that you want to get to know more about, but you're afraid to ask where did you come from or how did you get here? What was it like as a refugee immigrant in America? You can say, hey, what was the first thing you ate when you came to America? Um, but yeah, so that's how, that's how I got started. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to get all the presenters back up. Please give them a big round of applause. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, you guys stick together. So um, we're gonna go. <laughs> Get rid of the the, the the stuff in front of you. Yeah, set it aside. Yeah. She wants to get a good picture of you, and so I'm gonna stand way over here. So we're going to go down the line. We, we've got a, uh, everyone's going to have their own call to action they're going to explain, and then we'll do Q&A with the whole group. So stick around. Here we go. 
I think similar to my talk, it, it, it's to control what you can control. And if you get to the point that you can do something that you're passionate about in your community, to take action. Thank you, that was great. Um, my call to action would be, over the next 30 days, each of you, go out and check out one event or performance or restaurant, something that kind of belongs to a different culture that maybe you've never experienced, um, that is part of our cultural landscape. And when you do, take a picture and tag us at Mosaic Silicon Valley or Sangam Arts or SJMA and just show us what you've done. My call to action would be uh, to encourage everyone to support the arts. Um, you know, big players like SJMA and little players in the community as well. Um, and when you go, take a picture or a selfie. We have a really incredible selfie wall at Salt Stain, by the way. I do a lot of shameless plugins. <laughs> um, and um, hashtag new terrains and hashtag let's build an art community or let's share art. Yeah. Uh, my call to action, it, so all of us, we all drive around here and it's crazy, the traffic is nuts. So I would like to challenge all of you at least, at least twice in the next 30 days to take public transportation to your destination and then Selfie yourself and hashtag new terrains. No spaces. Uh, she took mine. Uh, <laughs> that's great. No, no, I, I think, um, I th and I mentioned it earlier. Someone asked about, you know, what we can do. I think um, really making sure, I, you know, a lot of us have probably lost faith in, like, the federal level of government at this point. Um, but there's a lot we can do locally, and a lot of decisions get made locally, and I think it's really important. It's, it's amazing the margins. Sometimes we have, we have uh, electoral margins at city council level of, like, 10 sometimes. So uh, be involved. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh, be involved. Um, vote. Find out what your, 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 your council members are, are, are supporting. Try to make sure that the, they're, they're aligned with your values. Try to make sure that they reflect your needs and your community's needs and not interests of, of, of you know, corporate, corporate interests in your neighborhood. So say be engaged in that way and make sure that, they're, that our leadership is accountable and responsive. Vote. Vote. Definitely vote. Um, supporting children and their creativity. They are the future. We're talking about 2040. The more we can cr uh, create spaces and uh, support our children and their creative expression and their stories, I think the better off we'll be and the more democratic society we'll have. So thank you. Oh boy. Deal. It went so fast for me. It flew by. I don't know about you guys, but I was super impressed. You guys are amazing. It was a breeze. You guys are a terrific audience. I'm glad it's over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I, despite the length of time I've spent speaking, I always get nervous. and I'm always glad when it's over, so I'm going to have a little bit of wine later. <laughs> Uh, the, the timing of this coincided with our statewide summit, I'm wearing a lanyard, is uh, we have a, a, an event called Pets Count here that's happening on campus at San Jose State University. So I've been up since 3.45 this morning. So I'm not entirely sure I did it yet. So I'm pretty loopy right now, so I, I, I didn't, I'm, I'm out of it.
Well, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I realize I could use a little bit more help on my public speaking skills. And it was just a great opportunity. And I think maybe Toastmasters might be my uh, next step. Thank you, though.